we're chatting with April Calm from Canada. Uh, April is a paediatric emergency physician and associate professor of paediatrics at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario. And she's been our PED EM track lead for developing EM since 2016. Uh, her CV is massive, and I'm not going to do any justice uh, to all that she's achieved in Canada and the world. So I'll just say it's a pleasure to see her again and thank her ahead of time for squeezing in an interview with us at what is an amazingly busy, frenetic time. April, how are you going? Uh, doing great, Mark. Uh, we just celebrated Canada Day, um, and you reminded me that, uh, you know, Australia is always ahead of the game for, with regards to time zone anyway, if nothing else. Um, <laughs> but we're, we're doing good here. Thanks. Good. A bit of that famous, nice Canadian humour there. It's always good to hear that. So uh, I, I think um, originally you and your family had been aiming to spend a bit more time in Columbia after the conference. Um, when did you get back home to Hamilton and what's the last three months been like at your place of work? Have you had to see icky, awful adult patients in your colourful, clean paediatric uh, department? So we went to Medellin after the conference ended uh, in Cartagena and we were so grateful to be able to see another part of a uh, beautiful country. Um, so really want to thank you and Sanj for putting on another fantastic conference and everyone else uh, that was on the organizing committee. Uh, we were lucky enough to have a flight booked back uh, to Canada Tuesday on March 17th and it's been surreal back in Canada just like everywhere else, you know, kids off to school, um, Yonel who's uh, my friend who's a family doc uh, doing a lot of patient visits um, remotely. Um, yeah, but we haven't seen any adults yet in the pediatric ED. Um, there, uh, there was a lot of talk about that back in March and there was even modules made for um, like adult emergency medicine 101 for pediatricians who haven't seen kids since med school. <laughs> so it got us a little concerned. Um, but, but, you know, that's not yet been the case for, for Canada. In, uh, in Texas and other places in the U.S., they were seeing uh, adult patients in their peds emergency departments, but not where you are? No, uh, yeah, no, not where we are. Thankfully, you know, it's pretty quiet low volume. Um, this was our photos from Cartagena before social distancing was a thing. I don't, can you see it too? A long time ago. <laughs> I know, we were all very close together. <laughs> a big group of us. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, so in terms of adults in the ED, not really yet, um, but we are seeing a lot, uh, like a way higher volume of um, just injuries in kids because kids are up about super active, which is great. Um, I did a like a national radio coast to coast kind of thing going over just uh, bike safety, trampoline, you know, whether to have one or not and things like that. They're all sold out. Um, and, and just sort of reinforcing for parents supervision when of course they're juggling working from home and things like that. So in fact, Anthony Crocco and uh, another uh, physician in my ED had to go on uh, also our national news kind of saying, telling people, hey, it's actually safe to come to the eMERGE, please come if you need to. We had to like actually kind of recruit, recruit patients almost. Right, so those all-terrain vehicles are a nightmare, aren't they? Uh, you're yes. seeing a bit of a spike in injuries related to that type of um, activity. Yeah, we are, we are. I mean, you guys might see a lot more of that in Australia and, and us as well uh, with people going to the cottages or out in the country. Uh, there was a big spike in ATV all-terrain vehicle accidents um, out west in Edmonton uh, recently. Um, so yeah, just making people aware that actually kids aren't supposed to be on those <laughs> and definitely not driving them. <laughs> so. Yeah, that, that's basically it. Honestly, I think it's almost the same for adults. We see so many bad injuries from those vehicles in all age groups. It's, um, it's a wonder they're still allowed. But anyway, that's off topic. Um, it, it's interesting to hear that the pandemic 
is having you know wide ranging effects that we didn't expect, like trauma and other things in children. I guess back in March we had an expectation that you know respiratory illness would predominate. Perhaps kids wouldn't be as severely as affected as adults. Um, what have you been experiencing in Ontario in regard to that, and and how are things panning out with the respiratory side of this pandemic around the globe? Yeah, we haven't really been seeing many children with uh, respiratory illnesses that that are actually requiring, um, you know, aerosol generating medical uh, procedures like intubations or anything like that. These are our uh, relatively recent COVID or critical COVID nineteen reports, and um, it's pretty it's pretty low comparative you know, compared to the US and, uh, and we're, it's not overwhelmed yet, our ICU system, which, or, mm -hmm. which is great. Um, and like I said, we're not quite like Texas yet. Mm -hmm. uh, but with regards to, um, you know, kids and COVID, uh, this, there was a recent publication in Science um, about the contact patterns uh, and in kids uh, in in COVID-19. And what they found interestingly is that kids were about a third as susceptible to coronavirus as adults were. But when schools were open and you know they were out and hanging out with other people, they were about three times they had about three times as many contacts as adults. Um, and so therefore three times as many opportunities to become infected. And so essentially evening out their, their risk at the end of the day. Um, yeah. Interesting stuff. I, I guess in, you know, we've sort of been thinking more theoretically here about the types of treatment that we might give children for uh, their respiratory illnesses. And there's been this huge amount of concern about the, aerosol generating procedures like nebulization, high flow nasal, CPAP and BiPAP uh, as being just almost too high risk for the staff to allow them to occur. But that's what we've got in pediatric respiratory medicine, all of those things. Um, and so although you haven't seen a lot of cases, have you been trying to avoid those procedures and and have you made any uh, adjustments to how you'd manage respiratory patients at the moment? Yeah, so in anticipation of, of respiratory viral season coming along, all the pediatric EDs um, in Canada are planning basically a quality improvement uh, trial or observation where we're going to be using epinephrine um, MDIs or metered dose inhalers to treat moderate croup as first line uh, instead of nebulized epinephrine. So it's, uh, they have it in British Columbia and in Alberta. We've acquired it already at McMaster Children's Hospital. It's been approved by our REV. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just, it's almost, it's kind of taking it to the next step in terms of wanting to keep our staff safe. Um, uh, and so, but beyond that, uh, we're, we're still applying high flow CPAP, BiPAP, uh, intubating as as indicated, uh, and using appropriate uh, PPE when when doing so. Well, it's good to hear that because I I think here we just became extremely paranoid about these treatments, and I guess as long as we take the appropriate precautions, they're still going to be uh, you know the backbone of pediatric respiratory management. So it's great to hear that from you. Um, I guess one of the less understood aspects of uh, the pandemic and the illness back in March was that there was this vascular inflammatory nature of the whole illness. Um, in the last month or so, there's been a lot of descriptions, case series and other things coming out about um, the inflammatory conditions related to COVID-19. Um, what can you tell us about this form of the illness and have you seen any cases and how should we be managing these patients, do you think? So what, uh, what has transpired uh, with regards to the Asian experience of COVID-19 has been on point, like we mentioned earlier, with regards to much lower pediatric burden of disease overall. The surprising part uh, is this temporal link of COVID-19 infection and, and these inflammatory syn syndromes that 
we don't have a great grasp on yet. So it rain, I think what we know is that it's a spectrum ranging from just fever and inflammation uh, to you know what we know as Kawasaki disease to what is now uh, named P PIMS or Pediatric Inflammatory Multisystem uh, Syndrome. And uh, the Center for Disease Control, the World Health Organization, um, CPSP, which is the Canadian branch, and the RCPH, um, uh, which I think is British, all have their own individual definitions um, of, of, of it. Um, so, <laughs> but essentially they all include children. Uh, they all include, you know, uh, some length of fever with evidence of inflammation and the, and the fact that um, generally multi-system involvement, uh, you know, and excluding other causes. So there have been a handful of journal articles, more and more coming out kind of every day, outlining this, uh, which include cases of pediatrics. Um, and so essentially the confusing or part might be, you know, what is the difference between Kawasaki and PIMS? And what, in terms of summarizing all the studies that are out there, what, what is found is that uh, PIMS tend to be in the slightly older age group than Kawasaki. Kawasaki tends to be like under five years or so, and PIMS is maybe more seven, eight. Um, eth Ethnicity-wise, Kawasaki was, you know, generally more predominant in the Asian population, and PIMS more predominant in the Afro-Caribbean population, which might explain why it wasn't as evident back when, uh, in, in China, for example, when, uh, when COVID-19 was first you know, first, the first impact was. Right. Also PIMS, there's more uh, GI symptoms, so more diarrhea, vomiting, abdo pain, uh, and, a, and a much higher CRP and ferritin level. Um, the two more recent uh, publications were one in BMJ uh, from uh, France, and it was just observational, like most of these are, and uh, kind of saying what I said earlier, that uh, the more, more commonly found in kids of African ancestry, more GI symptoms, more hemodynamic instability, and maybe more cardiac involvement, like myocarditis. Um, and then this one, fresh off the pet press in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, published June 29th. This is of uh, the, in the American cohort. Um, and what they found or what they looked at were, uh, you know, what, what laboratory findings there were, and it seemed to range uh, depending on the age group, et cetera. But overall, you know, still higher CRP level, um, slightly lower albumin um, and uh, lymphocytopenia and a neutrophilia. Um, interestingly, their median duration of fever were, was about six days, no matter which, what age group. So that's a little higher than, than all, the, um, all the organizations were calling for. They were saying like three days of fever uh, and more. So it's reassuring, I think, to us eMERGE docs, because we see kids, you know, with three days of fever all the time. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, in, that, in that sense, sort of, it was reassuring. So basically, yeah, like I said, PIMS or MIS or what you want to call it, basically a hyperinflammatory syndrome that is temporally related to COVID uh, exists. Um, and there's a wide spectrum of illness. And for us clinically, I think just knowing that we should be, uh, you know, noticing or taking note of these kids who are presenting with several days of fever and some inflammatory multi-system signs, they should get some lab work done. Um, if, you know, if there are increases noticed, with hemodynamic instability and changes, obviously you're admitting and treating regardless. But if it's just sort of laboratory changes, then they may be the cohort where you just sort of bring them back for a reassessment or something along those lines. Okay. It's a really fascinating insight you've given us here, April, on this evolving part of the pandemic. Um, it's by necessity a bit of a quick rundown. So listeners, we're gonna have some more information in the notes that are accompanying this video from April. Um, I guess overall, what do you think the next 12 months look like, you know, in your department and in Canada in general, uh, in regard uh, to the pandemic, the change in life that we've had, the, everything? 
Yeah, I mean, I anticipate volumes in pediatric ADs will, will still be lower than normal for the coming few months. Um, you know, a combination of people being afraid to go out to a potentially more crowded area, um, an area with sick people and things like that. And also uh, with increasing availability of primary care physicians um, and providers that are, are doing virtual clinics and things like that. Uh, however, uh, in Canada right now, we're, we're in various stages of reopening up, you know, uh, right now, restaurants, patios are open, opening up. So people are going out and eating, um, bird kingdom in Niagara Falls is opening up. <laughs> people are doing things like that. Um, so, I mean, it, depending on what happens with school come fall, uh, I'm anticipating probably the usual winter respiratory infection and volumes come January, February, and, and uh, yeah, I think that's what's gonna happen. Well, you know, it's encouraging, and we hope to remain encouraged, I guess, as time goes forward and have things to look forward to. Um, just to let you know, we're, we're still planning on going ahead with a 2022 conference uh, with partners in Africa. At, at this point in time, it looks like we might be in the southern zone of Africa somewhere. And uh, we'd really love it if you and your Canadian team could join us again. And you think that's going to be possible in a couple of years' time? Yes, I can't wait. Yeah, for 2022 in so many ways. <laughs> <laughs> Developing him, Southern Africa. Um, yeah, who knows what it'll look like. Uh, maybe we'll all be in masks and two meters apart or, <laughs> or maybe similar to the photos uh, that we showed earlier with everyone just sort of... Yeah. Yeah, but I'm definitely 100% on board. Thank you, Mark. Awesome. Well, look, it's been awesome to chat with you. Uh, I'm glad you and your family are doing well. And maybe we'll have another look at pediatric COVID in a few months' time with you. Sounds good. Thanks, Mark. Okay.